once more, the good Tully, Tullamore Dew. Ah, uh, yes. Not actually our sponsors, we just like them. We're an aficionado of their product, and it is this time that I must issue a challenge oh. to Sir Jacob. Oh, no. Uh, because of a series of events, I read an article on a very good website that you guys should all go read called PositivePerspectives.net. Yes. And yes. one of it's the a revolutionary, right. world-changing, yes. probably the best content I've ever seen. Anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. Go, moving on. It's a positive perspective. That's yeah. what we need these yeah. days with people burning places down and stuff. But anyway, uh, the challenge I'm issuing to Jacob, I am on a diet, so I'm challenging him to drink both whiskeys. He did not know this was going to happen. Do you accept my challenge? Um... <laughs> or will you be weak? <laughs> will I, you be a noob? I will accept your challenge. Uh, I just want to point out on the recording, though, normally when Brandon pours whiskeys, I don't finish mine by the end of the recording. I, mean, I don't particularly have the palate to consume all that much. Um, Indeed. So anyways, this is actually a legitimate challenge. It's not just... I just poured it into his glass. His glass went from Quite the glass. a quarter empty to half empty. I guess he would say a quarter full to half full. I or maybe would. that's flipped. No, <laughs> I don't know. I would. Well, oh, yep. Yeah, so, challenge accepted. We'll see how he does. Um, we're trying to move to more of a long form model. Um, this is actually the first episode where we well, put together show notes. That's true as well. It's funny how that came about. I basically said, yeah, we're a long form podcast. And, and Brandon. It's like his wheels started turning. He was like, wait, we're long form? We can talk for hours? So we're going to see how long this can go. And I yeah. figured I'm going to challenge myself by not drinking because I think my brain might move quicker. And I think Jacob will move quicker because he will be drinking. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's flipped. We'll see. I don't know. We're going to find out. It's going to be a social experiment for science. You know all those episodes on the scientific method? We're applying that knowledge right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's happening. So we changed the name of our podcast to Narratives in Philosophy. And for what obvious reasons. What does that mean to you? That's what we're trying to figure out here. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure if we've had a discussion about defining a okay. narrative. But Fair we enough. are no longer PPPP. We are now Narratives in Philosophy. And that is a valuable change. I mean, this is still a right. Positive Perspectives Philosophy podcast. Yeah. So if you're particularly attached to the name... I'm not. We, no, not, not you, our listeners. <laughs> if you're if attached, anyone out there yes. are particularly attached to the name, I don't blame you, I understand. And feel free to refer to it as, you know, ad infinitum. It'll just show that you were a, you know, episode one listener. Yeah. It'll give you that street cred out there. You were a 1.0 listener. Yeah. It's amazing. But yes, narratives in philosophy. Go on. And that's, that's what we're trying to figure out today, what we think narratives mean. Um, and Jacob asked me to talk a little bit about this narrative structure that I didn't really come up with. The way I describe it is I basically just saw this on display everywhere I looked. Yeah. It was just something that anywhere I looked, I couldn't not see it. And I just, what I chose to call it pretentiously was the master narrative structure, the narrative master structure. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about this is it applied not only in theology, but it seemed to apply in philosophy. Well, hold on. What do you mean not only in theology? Was there an assumption that this was a theological... Initially, this was a theological question in my mind. Okay. The question was... So it was more of a meta-narrative question then? Yeah. Okay, interesting. I didn't actually know that that was where this arose from. Yeah. The big question was, is, is it possible for the basics of a religious message? I'm not going to say any specific oh, religious... Oh, yeah. Okay. Of any religious message to be carried over into any minutia, like a novel or a movie or something like that. And I was like, okay, a religious narrative typically goes something like this. And all religions seem to hold this narrative. There is a problem that they put forward in the human condition that they want to solve. And then they propose a bunch of solutions. Yeah. Uh, and I, I see all of this being put forward. Every religion has their own list of solutions, whether it's five pillars or keep a list of rules, Ten Commandments, or pray a prayer, whatever it is, there's a solution. And then there's a final fulfillment, and typically that final fulfillment looks something like good living 
or an eternal state of bliss. And there might be a spectrum there. But interestingly, these final fulfillments are varying degrees of final. Yeah. Some of them tend to terminate at life. Some religions more emphasize the way of life. Other religions emphasize an eternal state of bliss. Just for clarity, could yeah. you specify where to put like nirvana on that? Yeah. You said it's that would be I tough. Yeah, that would be tough. tough. I wouldn't okay. know where to put that because I don't know enough about that tradition. But nirvana might be... Oof. I would put that in the same category as an eternal state of bliss. Okay. Now, whether it's an individual eternal state of bliss or just kind of an awareness of perfection of everything, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. I don't want to denigrate the tradition. That's um, probably the safest move because I'm not really sure either. Yeah. Um, that feels right to me is what I would say. It is sort yeah. of... Uh, I mean, it, it obviously wouldn't be the state, solution. So, yeah, wouldn't be a solution, and it wouldn't be a problem. That's true. Nirvana is so obviously. So you're almost you're yeah. almost fixing the final fulfillments uh, definition, because if it's a final fulfillment in an ultimate sense, you're gonna you're basically you're gonna see that in a religion, in any religion. So you yeah. kind of linked definitions and what you're looking for pretty well there, I think. Yeah, and we'll see how it applies. Uh, the next thing we could talk about, like, name a movie. Uh, Matrix. Okay, Matrix. Problem stated. The world that they are living in, that Neo is living in, is not real. Yeah. The world he's living in is a lie. Solution. He takes a pill. Final fulfillment. He's like some sort of freaking Christ figure <laughs> who brings salvation to all of these human people okay. against the machines. I like, just want to <laughs> control Z on that and go ahead and, and name the other movie that always comes to mind, 2001 Space Odyssey, and see how in the world... Ooh. Can you even do that? Oh, this is interesting. Okay, now here's the thing. Remember the end of that movie for a second, guys. He shows up like this <laughs> god baby. Galactic baby. Floating towards planet Earth. Yeah. My theory about the god baby is that that is a baby Ubermensch. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's thus folks are thirst you're playing. Oh, that's... Oh, wow. So here's my theory. I like Beginning it. of it, problem, humanity is not thoroughly evolved They're enough. They're a bunch of apes. They can't handle their surroundings. And evolution will get you to a, a, you know, a certain point. Solution will, you know, evolution will get you to a certain point, and then final fulfillment is this super evolved creature. But we need the uber bitch. We need the uber baby floating towards Earth, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. You passed on that one. I'm impressed. Well, well played. <laughs> so see... I keep on looking at things, and if you look at it deep enough, there seems to always be an application. Um, now, let me see. Let me see if I can throw one at you. Get okay. Jacob talking here. Oh, boy. Uh, okay, try Star Wars. Star Wars? Episode... Oh. Episode four. This is not fair. <laughs> a new hope. Oh, a new hope. <laughs> it's not fair because I literally cannot remember any movies. That's fine. That's fine. So How I about the last movie you watched? Or let me guess. The last movie you watched was the... Was, what was it? Was 2001 A Space Odyssey, wasn't it? It might have been. I actually, I watched it with Sarah more recently. Um, it's a watcher that you can watch multiple times, I'll tell you. It, it definitely is. What have I seen recently? See, I don't... That's okay, the thing. I'm let's take video games for a second. Okay, Call of Duty fair. Modern Warfare 2. Because Two. I remember there's specifically like a general in there or something. Yeah, I don't know that plot very well like the single player oh campaign. I'll remember number one there's a there's a group of terrorists that apparently have like nuclear capabilities or yeah. something like that yeah it's very very Iraq war oh so. even better how about this Black Ops here's what I remember from Black Ops okay now that one's a that one's a mind trip yeah you start out that one really <laughs> and you can't remember what's happening yeah so the individual arc of this character he starts out, he can't remember what happened in Vietnam or wherever it was that he went. Mm -hmm. If you're a black ops aficionado and I just butchered it, it might not even be Vietnam. As a matter of fact, I think it was Cuba. I apologize. He can't remember what happens in Cuba. Solution proposed. Yeah. Things happen to help him remember. Final fulfillment, we hope that he survives it all and gets out and doesn't die. Yeah. So I thought you were going to have me talk. Go ahead. You, you pick a video game. I just oh, picked one. Okay, I'll pick, I'll pick a different one. Um... Well, wow, Mario came to mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the master narrative structure applied to Mario. Uh, yes. I don't know why it came to mind. Let's Skyrim see. also came to mind, which is a lot easier. But, I want to hear uh, Mario first. Oh, man. I mean, that's a classic, right? You've got a princess and a damsel in distress master narrative thing going on here. And so mm -hmm. even if you're just an average everyday plumber, Mario... 
Or maybe you're Luigi, another <laughs> average everyday plumber. <laughs> Good. You can work through this pixel world full of evil mushrooms and even slay a dragon in order to save the princess. So the problem would be... There's a damsel in distress. Then a damsel is in distress. Yeah. That's a problem. We Absolutely. don't want damsels in distress. No, we don't. And we've got these crazy mushroom dudes. That's a problem. And an evil dragon. So these are problems, right? We've got problems. Solutions are, strangely, the average everyday plumber. Yeah. So an interesting solution, an excellent premise for a video game. Just clean house. Yeah. You know? yeah, you just, just do jump it. on top of these mushrooms and they die. Yeah. Uh, and then the final fulfillment, what would you say that would be? Um, I think it's tricky with Mario. You don't really see so much unless I'm missing something somewhere in the canon. Specifically, I'm thinking of the uh, Super, Nintendo, Super Nintendo Mario. Yeah. Or no, no, I'm thinking of the original Nintendo Mario. Um, just, yeah. Uh, the, the very old one. Um, <laughs> the final fulfillment is you either... You win. <laughs> yeah, you win. You don't have to I mean, the keep princess on is no longer in distress. Um, yeah. you, you've defeated the bad guys. Life goes back to normal. Presumably. Yeah. We'll say presumably because we don't really... Know or the game just ends. you could say that there's a journey that the player of the game is following as well, perhaps. Uh, yes. This is so weird. But it's great. The final fulfillment Woke for Welcome to player. our long-form format where we have time to talk about this. Literally anything we can talk about. So the final fulfillment of the player is they can be done playing or keep playing, mm -hmm. but then it's not final. Then it's purgatory. <laughs> but, okay, that's interesting. Well, no, Skyrim. it's interesting you bring that up. Yeah, go ahead. Because there are speedrunners who still play those games, and their goal is to complete it as quickly as possible. Hmm. So, in their personal narrative, working through that, there's the problem of competition, we could say. Yeah, people have gonna, done it faster, or nobody has done it fast enough, perhaps. Yeah, so basically the, the solution proposed is more competition. Yes. And the final fulfillment is competition. It, oh. I think that's an interesting one, because that, that really does seem to be the case, as far as I can tell. With, with, it's harder to see that in sports, I think because there's more monetary things involved and different things going on. Yeah. But as far as like hmm. competitive video games are concerned, where it's 100% not professional, no money flowing, the speedrunning community definitely comes to mind there. I mean, they well, do sure. some charity events, but um, for the most part, they're just doing it on their, on their own you know, volition. So speaking of competition, I mean, Call of Duty, I guess there's this thing called prestiging that you can do. How many times can are you, you do living that? in 2009? Dude, I haven't played video games in so long. I'm out of my depth. But here's the deal, yeah. folks. You might be noticing this narrative structure, this master narrative structure is getting applicable to anything we look at. But tell me about Prestige <laughs> <laughs> from right. 2009. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I need yeah, to learn so, something. You know, you might, you might play so much that you reach the maximum level in the game, but you still want to play more. And so what you can do is train in all your levels for one little tick on your prestige. Oh. And it's a little counter. So basically, I think it... Wow. It, and although, well, in most of the games I can think of, it has a limit on the number of times you can do this. Wow. And so eventually your max prestige, max level. Oh. And you get to flex <laughs> harder on the noobs. So you literally get rid of all of your guns and all of yeah. your stuff. And yeah. you, you give everything up. Just for one little... Um, you might call it clout. Hmm. It's almost like an anti-final fulfillment. Except now you've traded in your capital for... So... Like, yeah. real-world capital, almost. It's trading in a competitive advantage for... Uh, Respect. Re reputation, yeah. Basically. Oh. So you have a movement from tangible, quote-unquote, to non-tangible stuff. That's very interesting. What about Skyrim? And it's also fun progressing, too. So when you prestige, yeah. you get to progress through all those levels again, which many people enjoy doing. You know, when you level up, you get a little dopamine hit or whatever. <laughs> so. so the player for... Oh, man. The player's personal narrative, instead of the game's narrative, yeah. the player's personal narrative is the dopamine dopamine hit. Could be. Oh. I mean, I don't really know the brain chemistry all that well. but hmm. Now think about it, guys, for a second. What we've done, we've, we've hit a couple video games here. And now something that you can begin to do is compare all of these narratives and compare how effective or not, not or not effective, valuable they yeah. are. 
is a thing you can begin to discuss if you want to. If you don't like talking about values of well, things, we'll go into that a little yeah. bit. How would you how would you value one? Um, we'll just say one game against another in terms sure. of value. Well, I gotta say I would value the Super Nintendo or the original Nintendo speedrunning better. Okay, why? Because I'm getting to interact with all of these people and compete <laughs> and get faster than them. Interact. And I'm playing I think a. It deserves air quotes there because you're probably <laughs> in your basement and yeah, oh, your name. Goes We're sorry off. if you're that guy or gal. We we somewhere. do we do appreciate you. We appreciate you listening. Uh, but I would say it's superior to the Modern Warfare one because the Modern Warfare one, I'm taking a massive hit when I do it, and really. If I'm 13 years old and I'm, you know, ultra prestige, who actually respects me anyway? Like probably 45. In the real world, like yeah. anyone. But if you were speed running Super Nintendo, I mean, I meet somebody like that and I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. Is that personal preference, or are you really comparing things about you here? I'm just using what you said. You said it was just a dopamine hit. Yeah, it could. Yeah, maybe. When you level up. But okay. it could be the same thing when you get a faster run time. It's just a dopamine hit. Yeah. Okay, well then let's hold all things equal. For both of them, it's a dopamine hit, and we take this narrative structure and change it to something else. Comparing video games to your job. Now, yes, there's probably a amount of dopamine in there. Your problem stated for your job. I need a promotion. I don't have one because I can't pay the bills for my family. Solution proposed. I work harder. I get promoted. Yeah. In a perfect world. (laughs) <laughs> Final fulfillment. Let's pretend capitalism <laughs> works. <laughs> Final fulfillment. I get promoted and I'm able to care for my family. Now, let's compare the final fulfillments. A dopamine hit from video games, a final fulfillment of being able to care for your family. Both of these involve these things involve time. Yeah. Both of them have a narrative. Okay. But I think nobody would be willing to argue with me and say that the dopamine hit from video games if we were in a world where we have to decide what to outlaw, yeah. nobody's gonna outlaw taking care of your family, hopefully. They're gonna, if they have to outlaw something, they're it's, gonna have to outlaw the dopamine hit, if they have to pick between the two. Now, that yeah, would never happen. It's but. a tricky thing, road you're going down, because I don't think you've sufficiently delineated why the taking care of your family is of more value. Now, it could suffice just to say it's obvious that it is, yeah, but then you're appealing to some universal underlying truth, maybe. Yeah, a universal moral good, and uh, that's something we're actually going to get into when we actually start talking about the philosophers we want to talk about today, because Aristotle talks about this in his Nicomachean Ethics. Yes, the idea of there being a reason for something to be good. Now, I could give you his answer. Okay, which is that there are first principles. I'm so happy that you can just give Aristotle's answer. <laughs> No, like genuinely. I, a year ago, two years ago? It would not have happened, oh, folks. Man. But I was just reading this in my garage last night, and I saw, oh, he admits that there are things that humans hold to be self-evident and just true. Now, family seems to be one of those things for a few millennia, perhaps, we've held true now. You can argue about the hunter-gatherer period and say there were other things more important then, but and you could argue we're coming out of that stage, away from a nuclear family. You could argue that. That's fine. But in the world we've lived in for the past few millennia, it seems that the family is a self-evident value. And a dopamine hit was just discovered relatively recently on the clock. So I find one of those to be more self-evident. But... Let's let's keep thinking about this though. Yeah. Let's try this again. Skyrim. Okay. Skyrim, go. Um, <laughs> right. So dragons. Dragons are a problem, or are they a good thing? They're. Mm, They're a nuisance. They're certainly a nuisance. Yes. <laughs> it, it's a weird plot because dragons are a nuisance. I mean, you start as a prisoner. You're about to be executed. Thank you, Elder Scrolls, for starting all of your games at the lowest possible point of the narrative arc. It makes it really obvious that things can This only guy get has a, a lot of problems, if you yeah. haven't guessed yet. No, genuinely, when we talk about narrative arcs, you should, you should talk about the Elder Scrolls games because they all follow mm. the same narrative arc. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's one of the, the classic ones. You start at the lowest point and you end at the highest point. It's linear. Um, mm. So, anyways, um, yeah, you, you're about to be executed. A dragon comes in, disrupts things. <laughs> he ah. needs to say, you escape. 
just to find out that, you know, you're fulfilling prophecy and turns out you're the dragonborn and you're the one who will blah 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 blah. I don't actually know. But I mean you kill dragons and you so restore solution is the dragonborn final. It kinda of depends what yeah. quest lines you go down because you can do various things in that game. It's um, interesting. To fulfill the final fulfill so it could be different depending on what you do. You can apply that to individual people's lives, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because everybody has their own personal... I mean, that's the idea. ...final fulfillment that they set for themselves. Take your own quest. I mean, it's like those old books that you literally read through, and it's like, if you want to go down this route, you know, buy book seven. If you want to go down oh. this route, buy book 24. Now, I have to get you back. Are yeah. you living in 1975? <laughs> <laughs> I'm messing. No, that's so true. I'm sorry. Uh, I might... I might have Zork installed uh, currently, so um, <laughs> this is good. And, and no problem. That's much newer than the books I was referencing. So yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and come right out and say it. The uh, narrative structure, as you can see, grew into something half philosophy, half theology, because it cannot be separated from its religious undertones. Because when you have the discussion point kind of thrown into the mix of a possible eternal state it's impossible to talk about an eternal state to my knowledge without talking about religion yeah therefore even though this was hopefully trying to be a philosophical thing the final fulfillment you look at that and you say okay let me think of the most final thing i can think of an eternal state yeah well i just want to point out why are you apologizing um i mean i know there's uh, are you just trying to avoid Jesus smuggling here, or what's going on? I'm trying to avoid religion smuggling in general. Okay. And, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, hoping probably fair. that, you know, people will not uh, think that we're trying to do that. But I, I'm, I'm still not sure. Yeah, so long as people don't think we're trying to do that, I think that's right. It's not, The thing is with philosophy, there's a field of philosophy called metaphysics. Yeah. And was it not Plato who said that, you know, the consideration of God, basically theology, is the highest form of metaphysics? Maybe I'm way off base there, but it seems like I remember that. You know, we could try to put that in the show notes. Oh, that's maybe true. We, we could reference that. that. We could find yeah. where that's from. That could but, be uh, really good. Yeah. And you know, Pascal, up until recently, was another one of the philosophers, just like Plato, who thought things through and eventually got himself into a religious state of mind. In his book Penseus, he said, "Quote: Belief is a wise wager. Granted that." A faith cannot be proved. What harm will come to you if you gamble on its truth and it proves false? If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Now, you'll notice that I didn't finish the quote. Um, he then goes on to personify God in the male, and obviously he's referring to the Judeo-Christian God. Um, I tried to take that last part of the quote out so we could see this more broadly. Yeah. I think that's interesting. You brought Pascal's wager into it. Um, that's what that's called, right? Pascal's wager. Yeah. Um, I actually, I kind of referenced that in one of our recent book club meetings, I believe. And it's been a really, for me anyways, that has been the most convincing argument. I think I came to it organically. <laughs> but anyways. Um, it's the if-then-else yeah, statement? It, that's exactly right. Um, it's been the most convincing argument for me to actually consider eternal things. Like, full stop why think about afterlife? Why think about anything beyond no. here and now? Um, Pascal's wager. That's it. Because if there's any chance, if, here's the if, then else, if there's any chance of an eternity being true, whatever that eternity may be, then we should give it an infinite weight because it is infinitely long. Mm. Sorry to speak strangely, but that's no, you're not, you're just not to speaking strangely at all. Exactly, you know. But even better, why don't you uh, read... The statement, it's that one right there. I think it's the top one of the uh, highlighted. Because this statement really made it plain to me and got me considering these things deeper than I had before. So this is from Nietzsche's? Uh, the Nietzsche quote I'm about to read as a devil's advocate, sort of, oh, okay. to argue with you. Because I love arguing with you. Fair enough. Sorry, we're just that. referencing the show now. So, no. if there is an eternal state, then life must be spent ensuring its bliss. Else, eternal suffering yeah and then you can kind of turn this around and the response would be if there is no eternal state then men must make this present moment as beautiful as possible mm. else a wasted span of time yeah now 
you're going to notice that this is somewhat connected to the problem stated, solution proposed, final fulfillment. Now, both of these things have a narrative connected to them. Like, let's take the first one for a second. Problem stated if there is an eternal state. I want to figure out what the truth is about this eternal state and how to make sure it's good. Solution. Enter X religion here. Mm -hmm. Final fulfillment, an eternal state of bliss. Mm -hmm. So then you can take that final fulfillment, save that in your brain, and compare it to the final fulfillment in the next one. Problem stated, my life isn't good enough. Solution proposed, I earn money and make my life good. Final fulfillment, I die happy. Mm. No mention of a potential eternal state. Yeah. Now, that is where the age-old argument comes here. Yeah. So just to make it really explicit, what's yeah. going on here is we are discretizing the options. Yeah. Now, we're not assigning probabilities. We're just discretizing them. And then yeah. what we're doing is comparing the temporal aspects between them and saying you could spend a finite amount of time trying to improve a finite amount of time yeah. in the latter option, or in the former option, you could spend a finite amount of time trying to improve an infinite amount of time. Exactly. So for yourselves, uh, or for the, the sake of you just being really clear about this, Although we're not assigning probabilities to them, you can consider within yourself if there is any chance, we'll just say point oh oh one to whatever power you want, if there's any chance, and we know we're not capable of assigning that percentage, that's why we're not trying, but if we're saying that there is any, then the infinite amount of time outweighs, just fundamentally, just truthfully, like mathematically speaking, the finite amount of time. It doesn't take much... Um, mm -hmm trickery to, to say that. It's very straightforward. Absolutely. And that's the age-old argument. What weight should we give to the if in the statement? Yeah. The if being that's if exactly there right. is an eternal state, if there is no eternal state. Yeah. What weight do we give to that if? So I just want to maybe pump the brakes just a bit here and try and connect this back to what, what our opening statement about this podcast was. And we're trying to really reframe this as much as possible into a cohesive narrative of or narratives in philosophy. It can be plural, fine with that. Hmm. Um, so maybe recap where we've been so far in this episode for me. Yeah, think about it for a second this way. Problem stated, solution proposed, final fulfillment. And what we are basically doing, or at least what I'm doing, is anytime I look at a philosophical school of thought, I am looking at how far into the finality of the fulfillment it travels. And for me... Interest. For me, now this is not for everybody, but for me, I discount or take things up from every philosophical school in as much as it fits in the final fulfillment, which for me, that final fulfillment has to be, I hope, that whatever eternal state there is, is good. I hope that it is good. Yeah. And I want to do everything I can to make sure that it is. Uh, so that's the way I would say... And your I justification for that is this Pascal's wager idea. Pascal's wager applied to your if-then-else statement and also applied to the fact that I think your if-then-else is very similar yeah. to my master narrative. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think there's, they're, they work in tandem very well. So just draw this out for me. Where are we finding these narratives in philosophy? Just quite simply, a philosopher speaks and he seems to state a problem. Yeah. He proposes a solution. Now, it might be a way of life. In the Republic, for example. Plato's Republic. Yeah, he, he says there's a life of uh, politics, mm -hmm. and his solution would be you form society into all of these layers. You have gold people who are not allowed to necessarily get married. Um, their children are not owned by them. Yeah. They're disseminated throughout the group and owned by each other. You have silver, who are like the soldiers, and then you have the bronze, who are just craftsmen, workers. And for all intents and purposes, apparently the bronze can have as much of anything that they want as long as they're not, you know, rocking the rest of the boat at large. Uh, so his problem would be, let's think about Plato's problem. Yeah. Societies tend to fail. Yeah. Governments tend to dissolve into disaster. So he's trying to make something more sturdy. Yeah, something that fulfills all the needs of the human creature more efficiently, more optimally, and his final fulfillment seems to be no eternal state, but a more perfect union of mankind on earth. Yeah. No, I think that's good. I think that answers my question very, very clearly. Uh, I'm sure everyone can follow along with that. We're just finding these narrative structures yeah. from 
the philosoph the philosophers themselves and their work works. You know, it's intrinsic. Like we pointed out, you can apply this model to video games. You can apply this model to any sort of story. Absolutely. But you can also apply this sort of model to a wide variety of other things, not just those things that are traditionally framed as narratives. For and sure. In our case, we're finding those right here in philosophy. So I think this is a wonderful um, segue or continuation right into. We, we did want to spend a bit more time talking about Plato's Republic. Absolutely. Because last week, uh, and thank you so much, Stephen, for coming on the show and um, presenting your unified line. Um, it's been a, an interesting thing for uh, Brandon and I, for sure. Uh, it's revolutionized some of our uh, thinking about the world. We can go around and consider things in that framework. And I won't say, like, it's necessarily just you know, practically revolutionary and helpful, I won't go that far, but it yeah. is certainly a structure that has merit and is worth considering, and I hope that our audience can find some benefit from that as well. But that being said, that came from, or that was inspired by a relatively small part in Plato's Republic, right? Yeah, the chapter on cognitive function. Right. So we want to do a bit more justice to this extremely foundational, very important philosophical yeah. work. Absolutely. And talk about it just a bit more today. And if I remember correctly, he talks about cognitive function in the section where he's discussing about the education for his golden rulers. Ah, yes. Um, and, you know, there's this crazy stuff. Like, he considers the peak age of awesomeness for a person to be 60. Yeah. Like, something like that. You get to the age of 60, you've got your peak wisdom, your peak mathematical skill, your peak um, physical skill even, possibly. I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to put it past a Greek. I mean... Look at these statues, man. No, I'm kidding. All right. But anyway, that's the question that came to my mind. Do the solutions Plato proposes always fit, fit his problems? Yeah. And do his solutions necessarily lead to Bring about. his final fulfillments? Right, right. Because I don't remember any time in society when the Plato Platonic Republic has been implemented. That's true. And that fact alone, I think, can tell us... People don't really think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it is because it hasn't been tried, though. I mean, I'm going to argue for Plato here. Uh, sure. I mean, could I say for a second that his problem, governments are broken, yeah. would be fixed if I could somehow get people to organize themselves correctly? Okay, how are you going to get people to actually follow these rules? I think that's the bottom line here. I don't know how I'm going to do it. See, that's the point. That's the logical leap that I, I saw. Um, I you don't, conceded so quickly. I like. I really tried. <laughs> I picked your... You just pwned me. I got seriously pwned. His final fulfillment, uh, Brandon, has been pwned. Oh, dear. <laughs> he tried to devil's advocate this, and it, it lasted about two seconds. So. But think about it for a second, folks. How in the world are we going to get everybody to follow these rules? Could there be an assumption somewhere in here? about human nature. We've talked about human nature oh, yeah. before. Okay, interesting. So, uh, let me turn the question back on you. Does Plato Oof. comment on human nature? That's an excellent and question. And to what extent? Hmm. In the Republic. We don't have to work through It's not necessarily a thing you can quote, but it does seem to show that the answer to human nature from his perspective is yeah. education. Yeah, that's why no, I think educators. That's, right. that's yeah. what came to my mind as well. Educators like me, we love, we love Plato. Yeah, we love reading Socrates. Like there's a whole school of teaching, Socratic style teaching that is based on him. But does education necessarily help? Has it ever been implemented correctly? Maybe, maybe there's things yeah. that we have not done as a human society, which is why we cannot have a republic. So I want to point out a couple things about the republic, from my point of view, maybe reasons why we've not implemented the Platonic Republic. Uh, number one, it's a very clean system. It does not have exceptions. So I have a personal philosophical rule, I might say. Uh, I don't like systems with unsystematic exceptions. Hmm. And so um, I reject those systems. So I think Plato's system rejects not just unstructured exceptions, but all exceptions. Oh, there will be no exceptions. <laughs> and I don't really know, practically speaking, how in the world he would deal with that. And so in the real world, in a real society, you're going to have individuals, you're going to have circumstances, you're going to have natural disasters even, yeah. which are exceptions, okay? And 
I think part of why the Platonic Republic just never really got off the ground is is just that he doesn't really talk about them. You know, for sure. That was one thing that's just missing. And yeah. the other thing is he pulls a lot of things out of thin air. We'll say kindly. Um, absolute statements. There's a lot of them in the Republic. <laughs> Aristotle as like, well. <laughs> oh yeah, Aristotle as well. But like. I mean, even this three-tiered system, it's like he's basing it off of the proclivities of people and how to, are there clear lines of delineate what makes you bronze versus silver or silver versus gold? Yeah, it's just basically what you do. And, you know, it's an arbitrary choice that people what apparently... What if you do something between things, you know? What if you are a soldier and a craftsman? What if you are right. a ruler, but you decide to lead your army into battle? I mean, there's all of these things, and that's those are terrible examples that don't do it well, do it justice, but... Yeah, and also just to assume that people define their worth and their identity based upon whether or not they would are you say a soldier. he really assigned worth? Uh, it's kind of baked into the system. It Gold, really silver, <laughs> bronze, <laughs> bronze. I know, I know. What's I, more valuable? I mean, <laughs> no, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, <laughs> now, yeah, he doesn't necessarily assign worth. I don't remember a time where he comes out and does that. But where he's like, oh, this person's better than this person. I mean... Yeah, but it's easy for us to get it there. Right there. It rubs yeah. us wrong, right? That's certainly... Mm -hmm. I, just going on this kind of riff of why this never really panned out, that's certainly one of the reasons. It rubs sure. us wrong. And maybe it's an English language thing, but I'm pretty sure that translates pretty clearly. You know, In, Yeah, it's a very, very stable part of the narrative that he constructs yeah. so um, and it's not necessarily a thing that fits our society and our conception of society we are a society who loves exceptions yes everyone celebrate an everyone is an exception everyone. A, a beautiful exception yeah <laughs> so i would like to talk to us about aristotle because i have an axe to grind here all right i'm ready whenever i have an axe to grind it's not good oh but... i'm putting on my my thick um, fireproof gloves that can withstand all the sparks so here's what Aristotle asserts. Aristotle starts from the first principle of what is generally known to mankind, i.e. desire to achieve happiness. Uh, his narrative points at happiness. I would say that happiness is his final fulfillment problem. People are either falsely happy or not happy enough. Solution proposed, he proposes a moral uh, golden mean if yep. you will. Are um, you pulling this from Nicomachean Ethics? Nicomachean Ethics, yes. Okay, good, good. And the, the point of this moral middle road, not falling off on the left, and uh, so an example, folks, would be there's cowardice, there's courage, and then there's just a callow arrogance. Now, we don't want to be arrogant, arrogantly brave, and we don't want yeah. to be cowardly. Yeah. We want to be courageous. Yeah. So he would point the middle road, living down the middle road of morality for him. I really like this model. Yeah. If I can just maybe sure. insert a bit here. Please. Um, recently, I encountered a teacher who was talking about um, pride, except he was actually talking about insecurity. And at first, it didn't make any sense. And then I was like, wait. This is clearly a golden mean situation. Ooh. We have insecurity on one side, Ooh. and we have pride on the other extreme. <laughs> and somewhere in the middle is the golden mean, how we actually should uh, quiet consider ourselves. Thoughtlessness of oneself, quiet confidence. Just It was interesting because you didn't really um, see in these... What's beautiful about the golden mean is you don't actually have to define the middle road. And huh. we find that, it, for example, in... Um, the unified line, like we talked about last week, yeah. when you hit those higher levels of more truthfulness, you could say, yeah. uh, going up to the you know the ultimate good or whichever uh, ascended uh, ascendance of the uh, the scale you want to go down, it's really hard to define those upper levels. For sure, I think the golden mean is exactly like that. Whereas it's really hard to de to define the very middle. Yeah, perfection. You can define hmm. the extremes pretty easily, right? Because everybody knows them. And so yeah. the speaker was exclusively talking about insecurity. And I was sitting there going, and he he pulled out like a couple of Bible verses on pride in order to prove his point about insecurity. I was sitting there going, what in the world? Oh, it's a golden mean situation. That's interesting. This is how we... See, normally pride is juxtaposed with humility. Indeed. And humility is tricky because it's both a good and sometimes a bad trait. Like, 
if you're too humble, you don't stand up for yourself, for instance. True. Um, so people kind of can pretty easily dispense with humility as a, you know, arbitrarily good thing. And I, I think I agree with that. But it, di- it doesn't seem to me that humility is on the other extreme from Absolutely. pride. I think insecurity is. Now, that's interesting because a lot of times people point at Christianity and say that I don't like how simple, cut, and dry, black, and white this is. It's yeah. too, uh, there's this dualism. Uh, this, these false dichotomies abound. And I can totally understand that, but you're telling me that there's a third choice. Perhaps. Yeah. Interesting. Right there in the middle, and it comes from this structure. So before you um, grind your axe on Aristotle, um, I just wanted to maybe praise his golden mean It's a great quite system. A bit. Like, it, I it have no well problem for, for a number of things, and I think it really helped my thinking about certain um, moral, quand- moral quandaries, if you will, yeah, that it, many people have problems with. The middle with. road is the toughest one to find, but it's the wisest one. Humble doesn't necessarily look like you're constantly putting yourself down in front of people. And maybe humble is in yeah. the middle. It's just we don't juxtapose humility with insecurity, whereas we could. We literally mm. could do that, um, but it would ascribe new traits to humility. So there is some middle road there that that has, yeah. you know. It, it's Anyways, it's you, good. you can go on. Well, the axe I had to grind was that I don't necessarily believe that happiness as defined by Aristotle takes in all of the data as a philosophical school. Okay, go on. Because he puts forward this golden mean moral scenario. Yeah. His final fulfillment assumes that if you are happy, you got there because you lived a moral life, and that moral life you live will not only be good for happiness now, you can just assume it will be good however far into the future existence or being, what have you, goes. It's an assumption. Interesting. Uh, and there might be a false assumption somewhere in there. Okay. My, my problem is that his problem doesn't go deep enough. The problem is not just a lack of happiness. The problem goes to the, the source of the lack of happiness. People seem to not be happy with themselves. And the solutions they propose, a moral life, how do they know they've achieved that solution? Hmm. Because again... It's easy to fall off to the left. It's easy to fall off to the right. When you try to be humble, you say, okay, I'm gonna do everything I can to be humble. And then you, you, know, you start putting yourself down in front of others and you're thinking about yourself so much that eventually you realize, wow, I'm pretty self-absorbed and arrogant, even though I'm trying to be self-deprecating. So, so yeah, can you, can you not just self-adjust right there and continue down that route is that not just a bump in the road i don't know i don't know i'm I'm, my my assertion would be that it's very easy at that point to just jump over the road and go over to the other side of the road and fall back into a kind of arrogance people don't necessarily know how to be truly humble what does that even mean what does that mean? How do you do it? See, I could take this down a road to say that the golden mean reveals to us that the that the uh, the correct mode of being is actually unattainable because it's an infinitely thin line. Mm-hmm. Um, I could take us down that route. Now that's interesting because I don't seem to be- think that Aristotle would agree with no, that. No, I don't think that's now, an Aristotle concept. It's more of a but I agree with what you said. Modified. I agree with what you said, and I think it's true to the material yeah. and true to Aristotle's system. See, that's the thing. I think yeah. it's true to his philosophy. I don't think it's true to what he actually taught. Because he it. wanted to believe that it's possible to just... And this is yeah. really putting a lot of words in his mouth. But, um, no. That's my interpretation, for sure. So, we, we can take yeah. that for what it is. So, that's the thing. How do you prove to someone that you've achieved this solution? And then, how do you prove that this solution will necessarily lead to your final fulfillment? There's all of these logical disconnects, and at every moment along this narrative road, if you will, there's a moment where you have to close your eyes and jump across the ravine and hope that you're getting from solution to final fulfillment or from problem to solution. Yeah, I can kind of see your qualm, but I, I also have the counter of just saying, sure. yeah, that's how it is. You know, we, you have to just try it out and see, you know, 
uh, how it works, and oh. it's like it's a problem. Like ostensibly, it's a problem yeah. with um, that that you're pointing out. But at the same time, it's not. Well, we'll just use simple terms. It's not game breaking. It's not you know. It's not actually destructive of this whole system. I don't think that it's condemning. Well. Aristotle, to my recollection, does not necessarily consider a final afterlife. Plato does, and I believe uh, Gorgias, he paints a picture, and I believe Gorgias, or one of the books he wrote, it might have been the Symposium, one of his later writings, he talks about this afterworld where the wicked are wrapped in thorns and rolled down a hill for all of eternity. I think it was Symposium, if I have any memory. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so go on. What, he considers considers the potential of an afterlife. Okay. And the question that comes from this consideration, um, he's considering this afterlife from no religious context, just the possibility of it happening, and he seems to believe it will happen. So then the question you ask is, okay, can happiness truly be final as a final fulfillment? Is it good enough as a variable to fill I finality see. Of I that. see. So, see, you're fitting you're fitting Aristotle into your own framework, which might be a, might be a problem here. He doesn't want to play by your rules. He wants to play by temporal rules. He wants to say yeah. that in here and now is what we have, and that's what my that's that's what his philosophy is going to apply to. Hmm. Well, in that case, I mean, I have nothing to argue against him from a certain perspective. And you know, when I first read in Nicomachean Ethics. That was my initial uh, reaction. I remember it plain as day. Well, yes, of course. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, he's found the first principle. They're like, sure, that's fine. <laughs> and, you know, that, that, yeah, we want to be happy. I mean, what are people doing when they're religious? They're happy. What are people doing when they're trying to be moral or philosophical? They're happy. What are people doing when they drink tons of beer on the weekends? They're trying to be happy. Yeah. Happiness is common between it all. Uh, but that's the thing. So your axe to grind, then, is basically just that he's not considering things deeply enough. That would probably be it. And the quote that I have here in the show notes is that happiness is insufficient as a final fulfillment unless it is an eternal happiness. The if in the equation is a most terrible and weighty if. And this is referring back to your yeah. framework, which is if there is an eternal state. It's, just a, it's the most heavy if that I think we've seen in any philosophical or theological consideration, the heaviest if in history. I think that's really good, because what you've just drawn up is that not only is Aristotle not playing by your rules, but he should be. <laughs> he should be considering, because that if is so weighty, right? Potentially. Potentially. Uh, and, you know, I didn't get to do this earlier in the show, but since we're on the topic of this if, Nietzsche says, quote, this is from The Birth of Tragedy, page 23, Walter Kaufman translation. He says, Christianity was from the beginning essentially and fundamentally life's nausea and disgust with life, merely concealed behind, masked by, dressed up as, as faith in another or better life. Now, here's the thing here. Nietzsche doesn't give heavy weight to this if. And what you could say here is, you know, yes, Nietzsche is attacking Christianity, but any religion is postulating in the future another or a better life of some kind yeah. as their final fulfillment. I think you're pointing out something very important here. Nietzsche is effectively saying that Christianity is erring in that they're just looking for another life like this one. Right? He's making Ooh. that sort of assertion right there that whatever comes next will be not really you know, any better, any less atrocious than what we have now. So, that is an er, I guess. Yeah, life's nausea and disgust with life. A, a, a nausea and a disgust with the here and now. Yeah, you might read that again. Yeah, Christianity was from the beginning essentially and fundamentally life's nausea and disgust with life. Yeah. So he's, he seems to be asserting that the here and now is not good enough. But then the second part of the quote. <clears throat> yeah. Merely concealed behind and dressed up as faith in another or better life. Yeah. I.e. the... The next supposedly better yeah. echelon of existence or being. Now we're kind of just picking apart one of his quotes here. It so really is it, it yeah. quite summative of much of his work because yeah. he says in most of his works that Christianity loses out on a lot of goodness because it's constantly looking for the next, looking for the next thing, okay, and losing the only thing that we have. Yeah. 
So what validity might there be to just saying, if be damned, live with goodness in mind now? I mean, it's right there embedded in the if then else that we've outlined. It's, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's the now. Nietzsche can't prove right. to me, and he couldn't prove if he was alive today, that there isn't right. a future state, I guess. Yeah. And I can't prove to him... So for us to believe fully that there's not it is really not dangerous. giving sufficient weight to the if. That's, that's what we're saying. And that's the final goes thing. goes right back to Pascal's. This is the final statement that we have here. And this is really, I think, the last thing I had to say today. It's, okay. As men cannot prove the lack of an eternal state, men do well to assume that it exists, else the possibility of eternal suffering. So as we do well to assume, else. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sums I, it up. I can't, I mean, I can't prove it. Yeah. Nietzsche can't prove there isn't. I can't prove there is. As far as I'm concerned, this is very clearly outlined, very logical, very straightforward. Uh, and like I said, on a personal note, this has been the most convincing thing from a very young age. And like I mentioned, I think I came to this this thought pretty organically. You know, I thought about these things. I was like, well, if there is an afterlife, then I really, or if there's even a chance of an afterlife, in fact, I really should think about it a lot. Like, I should figure mm-hmm. it out as much as I can. Um, so th- that sums it up, really. And, you know, that to tie it back into my narrative as well, Yeah. by specifically talking about what you and I are trying to do here. Oh, yeah. Problem stated. People don't know what to believe. Mm. Solution proposed. Analyze beliefs. Final fulfillment. Hopefully, we hope, that we're able to come to a point where people can say with better certainty yeah. that what they believe is true. I like that. I like that a lot. And, um, you know, I hope it. As we go on, this narrative structure will serve us well. I think we can even have some fun with it, make some characters, point out some plots, you know, um, and really plummet to its depths in this Narratives in Philosophy podcast. And really the characters are, what's so exciting about this is the characters for this story are the characters of history. Yeah. And that's what's amazing. Well, it's deep because they're the characters of history. Yeah. But it's also, you're the character. I'm the character. You know, the listeners are the character. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can you can put yourself really right here in that story, in this narrative, mm. uh, and live it out for yourself. So that's what we're going for. Uh, hopefully that's uh, extremely clear. <laughs> that was the idea. I think we'll go ahead and end there. Thank you for listening to the Narratives in Philosophy podcast. Uh, in real time, we've recorded a few months ahead, so we're actually pretty excited for this whole show because we've just released the first podcast, which you probably listened yeah. to. Feel free to like us wherever you get your podcasts. That will really help us out. Um, and uh, and tell your friends if this is something that has intrigued you. Let others know because uh, we think it really has uh, the wide appeal uh, for anyone who likes thinking, frankly. so <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we'll end there. Thanks uh, for tuning in and good night. For the record, I was one tiny, tiny sip away from finishing Brandon's challenge, so yeah, we're going to level him up, on that one? We're going to level him up, because that was maybe just two shots. That was a double shot. Of <laughs> we're going to continue to level oh, him boy. up, and All by right. the time we uh, come back next time, hopefully we'll have him with a whole dram. <laughs> a whole dram of whiskey. Yeah, it was enjoyable, <laughs> so anyways, uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>